2 Samuel 9, we've seen a picture of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. It's going to be fun, right? We've seen a picture of Mephibosheth as that of a sinner in desperate need of mercy and grace. And then we see him who is spared death and he receives life. But when David said to him in verse 7, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan, for Jonathan thy father's sake. The picture of Mephibosheth now changes from that of a sinner to that of a believer. And not just a believer, but a believer who is following their master. This is what we see in his utter submission to David that we talked about last week, that we made the point to, to, to establish that that doesn't expire after salvation. Utter submission is definitely required for salvation, but it is also mandatory if we're going to walk with God in a way that is pleasing to him. And so we see that in Mephibosheth. So our focus now shifts from evangelism simplified to discipleship simplified because the portrait of Mephibosheth has now changed. And there are some things that I do believe the Lord would have us to glean as we walk through this. And what Mephibosheth experienced technically as an adopted son of the king is what you and I experience as adopted sons of the king. Because we've all been adopted if we're born again as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to make sure you understand everything that we're going to talk about today is available to every believer in Jesus Christ. Everything we're going to talk about is available to every believer in Jesus Christ. But listen, only those who are truly following him as disciples indeed will actually experience it. It's available to you and me if we're saved. But to actually experience what we're going to talk about today, to experience it in its fullness, we actually have to come after him as disciples, indeed, true disciples. So we dive in, verse 7. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. So Mephibosheth was not only spared death and given life, but he was also promised blessings, rich blessings. And is this not our story also in Christ? That we have been spared death and we've been given life. If we have the Son, we have life. And if we have not the Son, we have not life. But we have the Son, so we've got life, and we've got all the blessings that come with that. Consider Romans chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. Uh, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Rich. If you've called upon him, he is rich toward you. What a blessing. We're not just talking about King David. We're talking about the king of kings. We're talking about the king of the world who says, if you've called upon me, I, I am rich toward you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be, say it with me, rich. This is why it is so critical for you and me to be biblicist. To be a biblicist. That is, the lens that you look through, the lens that shapes how you judge everything, is the Word of God. If you're not careful, you can watch the news and, and, and you can hear all the rhetoric about inflation and how hard it is to make a living. And if you're not careful, 
you can actually start to believe that you're poor because of your bank account or because of your 401k and all of these sorts of things. I understand those things. I understand that there's a, that there's a place to have those conversations. But listen, that is not what ultimately determines whether or not you are wealthy or poor. What determines whether or not you are wealthy or poor is who you are in Christ. If you are in Christ, you've been made rich. You're rich. But what does the Bible say about you as a believer in Jesus Christ in terms of what that looks like and, and, and how that ought to work and function in your life? Well, we're going to get a visual this morning because David's kindness to Mephibosheth was experienced in two distinct ways. Number one, restoration. Restoration. David said in verse 7, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. Now, the land that was in view or would have been in view here was not the land that Saul ruled over in the kingdom. But this would have been the land that was his personally, his private land, if you would. And that would not have been small. We'll justify that a little later in in the narrative, if you would, when you look at the amount of servants who were dedicated to work this land. So it was not small. So Mephibosheth essentially received an inheritance a sizable one. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. What's in view here clearly is the believer at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what's in view. And this is the person as a disciple indeed who is going to receive the reward of the inheritance. It becomes official at this moment more than ever that their labor in the Lord was not in vain. It's an honor to serve the Lord, is it not? It's a privilege. But if we're honest in the flesh, we're human. And at times we get weak. At times we get weary. At times we get discouraged. At times it's very hard. At times you're just spent and you've got nothing left. And sometimes there's that voice in the back of your mind because we're human that says, is this really worth it? Yeah, it is. And it will become very official at the judgment seat of Christ that it's, it was more than worth it. More than worth it. Restoration deals with something that I have experienced in my life, but it it, it deals with renewal. It it deals with recovery. It it deals with reestablishment. It's a wonderful thing that God does. And what we discover about God and his word and through walking with him is this. This is a wonderful thing. God is in the business of restoration. God is in the business of restoration. God can give us beauty from ashes. He can. Right? Joel chapter 2 tells us that God is able to restore the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the palmer worm, and all that. God is in the business of, of restoration. God can take a man like Mephibosheth, who was essentially in hiding, fearing for his life, and restore him in a way that just would have blown his mind. God can do that. Exodus chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field 
all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. So uh, to serve with rigor meant that Israel had to serve with cruelty. This was oppressive. This was satanic. It was evil. Uh, When it says that they were in hard bondage, it, it referred to not just slavery, but severe slavery. This was an awful existence. They were essentially wasting away in Egypt. There was no reward or inheritance for them, which meant there was no glory for God to be had in that. And that's what God is all about, right? He's all about glory. There is no glory for God in my life or yours when we're in bondage. None. The phrase, serve me, in the book of Exodus is mentioned seven times. The phrase, serve the Lord, is mentioned eight times. Why did God liberate his people out of Egyptian bondage? Because he wanted them to serve him. Why? Because that was how he could get glory. That's why he restored them was so that they could give him glory. This is why it is so paramount for you and me to make sure that we are actually walking in the victory that is ours in Christ. Why? Because when we do, guess what? God is glorified. He's glorified. Exodus 13, verse 3. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Bib. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it reminded God's people of his deliverance of them out of Egypt. They were never to forget that. And let me remind you, you are never to forget your deliverance from Egypt. This is one of the reasons the Lord is giving you the Lord's Supper so that you never forget his deliverance in your life. Leaven in the Bible, as we understand, is always associated with uncleanness. It's always associated with defilement, and it is something the Bible tells us we are to put away. So when they would observe this feast, it was a reminder of what God had done for them, but it was also a call to separation from where they were and what they were exposed to in Egypt, it was a call for, to, to separate from that, and it was a call to embrace holiness. There was to be no leaven in their life. And we, you and I have that same call as well. But in Egypt, they served with cruelty, and they served in severe slavery. But listen, they could not serve the Lord. They could not honor or keep this feast. They couldn't worship God. They couldn't experience the restoration, the renewal, the revival, the recovery. In that land, they had to be in a land flowing with milk and honey so they could properly glorify God. That's restoration. But that's our story as well, right? We all had our conversation in times past in the lusts, plural, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires, plural, of the flesh and of the mind, Ephesians 2, 3. In that way of life, in the flesh, in our unsaved bondage, we were slaves to the desires of our flesh. All of us were even if that was self-righteousness. We all were. 
We were slaves to that, which meant we brought no glory to God. None. But at salvation, we experienced restoration. We experienced renewal. We experienced recovery. We experienced reconciliation. Ephesians 4, 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Again, that's plural. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This word renewed in verse 23 is one of the most amazing, incredible, phenomenal words in the word of God. I love it because it simply means to renovate. It means to renovate. If you've ever renovated a house or if you are familiar with that, that's not a tweak of a process. No, you're actually gutting out everything and restoring it, replacing it with things that are new and better. This is what God does. This is what God looks to do. This is what I'm saying. Listen, what God is not interested in as it pertains to your life and mine is a tweak. God is not interested in saying, okay, I, 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 I want to save you so that you can just be a, a better version of yourself. God says, no, that's, that's not what I mentioned. As a matter of fact, I am looking to renovate you. I want to renovate how you think. I want to renovate how you speak. I, I want to renovate how you walk. To the point where you don't even recognize you anymore. Remember Saul, right? He's in a synagogue and he's confounding the Jews. We talked about this last week and proving that this is very Christ. And they're going, who is that? It looks like Saul. It sounds like Saul. But do you hear what's coming out of his mouth? I can't be the same guy. That's what God is after in your life. Not just a tweak, a renovation. Colossians 3, 8. But now you also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. That's amazing, is it not? That's good. The spiritual image that was lost in the Garden of Eden through the fall of man, has been restored to us in Christ. In Christ, we bear the spiritual image of the Son of God. Now, to understand where we're ultimately going with this, I need you to look at verse 9, starting there. Okay? just want to lay some groundwork, but, but, but I want you to see, because this, this is where we, we really turn the corner, if you would, and get very practical. And we come face to face with our responsibility in this. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants, stay with me, shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the, in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. David restored the land that belonged to Saul. 
He restored that to Mephibosheth, but listen, that land had to be tilled. It had to be worked. It was his. But that land had to be worked. God took Adam and he put him in the Garden of Eden. To what? Just hang out in it? Just enjoy it? I mean, this was before the fall of man. Even before the fall of man, Adam had to dress it and he had to keep it. He had to work. He had to work the land that God gave him. Listen, discipleship is the process of working out the spiritual image of Christ that is in us. That's sanctification. This is what discipleship is. It's working out the spiritual image of Christ that is in us, but this reveals a major problem regarding discipleship in the church today, and it is this. Laodicean believers are spiritually lazy. This is a major problem. Laodicean believers are spiritually lazy. They don't want to work. (laughs) They don't. It's interesting... Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, but verse 9 tells us, not of works, lest any man should boast. Praise the Lord. Our salvation is by grace through faith. It's not of works. No one is saved because of what they do or what they will have done throughout their life. We, we understand that. Okay, and then we, it's almost like everything that is recorded after verse 9, we, we stop. But verse 10 has something to say. For we are his, would you say it with me? Workmanship. Workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Again, the the same reason that God brought Israel out of Egypt so they could serve him is the same reason that spiritually he brought you out of Egypt so that you could get to work for his glory. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are believers who fantasize about becoming the Apostle Paul, about becoming a strong spiritual believer, becoming a disciple indeed, a mighty man of God, without doing anything. (laughs) They're unwilling to read. They're unwilling to put the time in to study. They're unwilling to pray. They're unwilling to faithfully attend church. They're unwilling to ultimately obey. I don't want to do anything, but I want to be this victorious, mighty warrior. I want to be this spiritual giant, and I'm just going to wake up one day, and it's just going to jump all over me. I'm going to know the Bible like the back of my hand from Genesis to Revelation. I'll be able to rightly divide it. Man, I'll be able to teach very well. I'll be able to pray, like, I mean, really pray. Man, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be able, then I can really evangelize and, and, and I can disciple others and I can go on mission trips and I can do all these things. It's just going to, it's going to happen. Let me know when that day arrives. I'll join you. <laughs> can you hear this? Grace is a multifaceted gift from God. It's multifaceted. That is, there are different aspects of God's grace. Grace, listen, this, this, is, this, is, this is a moment for a correction, maybe. 
But grace does not always mean we do nothing. That's, <laughs> here's the thing. <laughs> what grace ultimately means after salvation is that God will supply you with what you need to do everything including enduring hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. You all know the story. Paul's got this thorn in the flesh. Three times he cries out to the Lord to remove it. And what's the answer? My grace is sufficient for thee. I'm not going to remove the thorn. But what I am going to do is I'm going to supply you with the grace that you need to endure the thorn. It's multifaceted. I mean, you can't do anything without the grace of God. You can't serve, you can't study, you can't name it. But again, it, it, it's not that I just sit around and I do nothing and say, well, you know, that's the grace of God. Yeah, you're going to be stuck for a long time. Which brings me to this. In the initial call of Jesus to his disciples, what did he call them to? I mean, think, think about it. This is the initial call. You see it early in the Gospels, the first three in particular. Matthew 4, 19. He saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus, in the initial call of his disciples, called his disciples to evangelism. I mean, this is, this is the first thing that he had to say to them. Hey, you're going to follow me, and here's what I'm going to do. Which spoke to what this whole discipleship thing was going to be about. I'm going to make you like me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. We said that discipleship is the process of working out the spiritual image of Christ in us. But listen. Discipleship is also the process of leading others to receive the spiritual image of Christ. It's not just that he wants to work out the spiritual image of Christ that's in us. That's great. But if that's actually happening, then this is also going to happen. Where he is now going to use us to lead others to receive that spiritual image. It's not enough for you and I just to get it. It's that we've got to lead others to get it. I, I can't, I, I don't know, I wonder. Listen, God desires deeply. It burns in the heart of God to use you, to use me, to win people to his son and disciple them. Like that's God's heart. That was God's heart in early in Genesis with Adam and Eve. Again, God, what, what was his heart there? God's heart was that Adam and Eve would populate planet Earth with human beings who bore his likeness and image. We lost the spiritual image of God in the garden. We get it back in Christ. And God's heart is still the same. God is grieved when he looks at humanity and sees Adam. Because in Adam all die. God says, I want to see the image of my son. And that is the business that he wants us to be about. So here's the question. On a scale of one to ten, ten being the highest, how deeply do you desire that? How well do you sleep at night if you've gone days, weeks, months, God forbid, years without preaching the gospel? How comfortable are you when you get in your car on Sunday morning and you, you leave to drive here and you see your neighbor out worshiping in their yard, watering the lawn? pulling weeds. 
Is that, is that okay? Does it, does it bother you when you have an encounter with a lost person and the Holy Spirit of God is prompting you to speak? Tell them about Jesus. Talk to them about what he did for them. And we quench the spirit in that moment and get in our car and go, well, you know what? They wouldn't have believed it anyway. Can you sleep with that? You okay with that? Does that not bother you? Does it not burn in you to win people to him and disciple them? One to ten, where's that? I'll let you work it out with the Lord. Next, David's kindness to Mephibosheth was expressed through restoration, but it was also expressed through provision. It was expressed through provision. Look at verse 7 again. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Look at verse 10. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all way at my table. Verse 11. He shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Verse 13, so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table. Provision. And that provision included two things. Number one, sustenance. Mephibosheth and his servants would have had more food than they could have ever eaten. And again, David emerges as a type of Christ in verse 7 because it says that he provided bread for Mephibosheth. And that takes us right away to one of the great I am's that Jesus utters in the Gospel of John. John 6, beginning verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never hunger thirst. The manna that God provided through Moses, it provided nourishment, but here's what it didn't provide. It didn't provide life. It had limitations. Uh, Jesus does not only provide nourishment, he provides life. He is the sustenance of life. And we see that picture here. David has provided Mephibosheth with life and bread. You see that? Beautiful picture. Now, to narrow the discipleship focus here, <laughs> the table for Mephibosheth was set. Was it not? The table was set. David assigned Saul's servant Ziba, his sons, and servants to work the land, which would have provided food for all of them. So when we're talking about discipleship, listen, the issue is always an issue of appetite. When we're talking about discipleship, the issue on the table is always appetite. Listen, a disciple indeed has a strong appetite for the Word of God. Listen to me very carefully. I'm not just referring to those who are being discipled. I am also referring to those who are discipling. A disciple indeed has a strong appetite for the Word of God. Notice these words, verse 7, continually, verse 10, always, verse 13, continually. That's a picture of someone who is continually feeding 
on the Word of God. A disciple indeed. I've been discipling since 1995, and I've been involved in discipleship ministry from a leadership perspective for a number of years now. And I'm going to tell you, one of the biggest determining factors for success in discipleship is an appetite for the Word of God. A strong appetite for the Word of God. Listen very carefully, please. I'm not talking about their appetite or their interest in knowledge. I'm talking about their appetite for and their interest in the Word of God. I'm not talking about some academic exchange. I'm not talking about someone who, who envisions that, oh, I'm going to grow through this process, and, and, and I'm going to be a scholar, where it's all head, no heart. What determines if someone truly gets discipled and becomes a disciple indeed is, I mean, their appetite for this book is continual, it's always. Like a baby with an appetite for milk, they got to have it, don't they? And they let you know it, don't they? By the way, I, I get that verse in First Peter, but, but please, I, I don't think we should look at that as, well, at some point we graduate from that. The moment you graduate from desiring the sincere milk of the word, your days are numbered spiritually. I mean, I'm talking about a, a passion, man, a love. My God, I, <laughs> I got to have it. I love it. Husbands, fathers, hey, if there's something that your wife and your children must know about you is that you love this. You love it. And you're not, you're, you're not, I was told years ago, and I agree with it. Um, my pastor taught me years ago, um, don't be a preacher in your home, right? Don't, don't walk around preaching at your wife. And, and, and I had to work through that early in our marriage and Praise the Lord, God got me over that. But, but okay, no problem. But listen, here's what you do have to do. It, it, it's got to be clear. I, I had an amazing conversation with my son the other day. Uh, it, we intersect quite often. He gets up very early, like me. And, uh, and, and so he had some questions about what's happening in Israel. So we got to sit down and we got to talk about the Word of God. We had a great conversation. Talking about the word. And he had questions. And I, I was just so thankful. I was like, Lord, I just, I'm so grateful that he's got an appetite and he's got an interest in what your word has to say. He's not, you know, the, the news is saying this and this outlet says that and this one says that. What he wanted to know is what does this outlet say about it? Fantastic conversation. See, a disciple indeed is going to have an appetite for the word of God here and here. It's not just going to be here, but the, the, they're going to crave it here too. Listen, the king's provision also included sonship. Not just sustenance, but sonship. Verse 11, as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. This is a picture, once again, of our adoption in Christ. Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, 
God only has one begotten. But listen, this is the beauty. This is the power of truth. The adopted son has the same rights and privileges of the begotten son. That's us. Can you wrap your mind around that? That your sonship, you've got the same rights and privileges of God's only begotten son. That ought to get you a little excited. Like, I'm not one to ask for amens, but boy, I tell you what, I think if there was ever time to ask one, that's right there. That you have the same rights and privileges that the Son of God has. Wow. Thank you. Like a king's son, Mephibosheth had servants. Ziba had to have been a man of importance unto Saul. It says that he was Saul's servant. Not just a servant. He was Saul's servant. Not only did he have 15 sons, but he had 20 servants. This guy was a big deal. And now all that is coming under Mephibosheth. The story opened with Mephibosheth essentially hiding out in Lodabar, a place not close to Jerusalem. But as the narrative comes to a close, where do we find him in verse 13? So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. So he's no longer in hiding from the king. He's now dwelling with the king. Like a son. He's not just feeding on the king's provision. He's fellowshipping with the king. As I close, I love MBT. I love the church. I don't have words to capture the love and the adoration and the respect that I have for our pastor, Sam Miles. It is an absolute delight to serve the Lord under him and with him. I love what I get to do. I love who I get to do it with. We're not a perfect church. I get that. But I, 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 I don't want to be anywhere else unless or until the Lord says otherwise. And I'm not looking, not hunting for anything. I'm very content. Some of you are like, I wish you would look and hunt. Sorry, keep praying. But, I mean, is God not doing some special things here? Have we not? I mean, those who were here from the very beginning, you know, God's doing some pretty cool things here. But you know what? I've talked to a number of you, and we've seen this movie a few times, haven't we? Haven't we? And the ending is not very good, is it? And that ending is what drives my perspective and my approach in ministry. Consider Revelation 2, verses 1 to 4. Until the angel of the church of Ephesus writes, These things saith he, that hold the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first loves. The biggest concern I have about Midtown Baptist Temple is that we become the church of Ephesus. That's the biggest concern that I have. This church of Ephesus was zealous over the right things. But listen, their love for those things became greater than their love for the Lord. 
That's the concern. I have no concerns with our position on the Bible. I have no concerns with the doctrine that we teach. I have no concerns with our philosophy of ministry and discipleship. My concern is that we will love those things first and more. That's the concern. This is why that period of church history that lines up with the church of Ephesus shows the entrance of Greek philosophy that penetrated the church and with it came traditions that were not rooted in Scripture. I've sat in churches where I've seen a a pastor get up And I mean just rail and rail and shred to pieces Catholics, charismatics, uh, just tear to pieces those who use Bible versions that are based on a critical, corrupt text. I've seen them get up and and just uh, annihilate the government And the people, they shout in agreement. Amen. Preach the word. They are affirmed in what they know and what they believe. It is what I call very safe preaching. Why is it safe? Because it critiques and it examines everybody except me. We, 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 we get to talk about how messed up they are and how messed up they are and how off base they are and how a mess they are. Yeah, look at that. That's terrible, isn't it? But I mourn. I have mourned. Because every church I've been in like that, two things are very clear to me. That church is operating on borrowed time. It's just a handful of self-righteous, discontent, very unpleasant believers who are not evangelizing, they're not making disciples, and this church is literally on life support. And I've asked myself, where is this place going to be in five years And the second reason I mourn is because they love their convictions and their passions more than the Lord. It's Ephesus. They hate the right things. They just love that more than the Lord. Please, as I wrap up, you're like, you keep saying that. Are you really going to wrap up? Yes, I'm just about there. As the discipleship pastor here, and I'm not one to drop titles, I'm not, but I just have to make this clear. As the discipleship pastor here, this is what discipleship must be and will be about here, as far as I'm concerned. It is this. A disciple indeed loves the king more than what the king provides. Thank you for the word. (laughs) Thank you for the provision. You've given me a lot. Oh, my goodness. But I, I love you more than anything. You know what? We're going to see this later in 2 Samuel with Mephibosheth. His love, his gratefulness, his devotion to the king will be tested. And we're going to see how he does. And so will Zybus. Lord, I do believe we heard from you this morning. 
I do ask that what we've heard, we will not let fall to the ground. In Jesus' name, amen.